Star Wars 7x7 episode 2733. All right, let's circle back to finish off the War of the Bounty Hunter storyline that we were talking about with all the things that we can learn about Boba Fett and possibly about what may happen or what we might encounter in the book of Boba Fett. Punch it. Hey Rebel Razor, I'm Alan Voivod and this is Star Wars 7x7, your daily dose of Star Wars joy and thank you so much for joining me for it. So we'll knock out Dr. Aphra's issue right away because there isn't anything that directly relates to Boba Fett or the Book of Boba Fett in there, but I will say that you know they managed to escape with this necklace thing that we were talking about in previous episodes where we were running down the whole storyline situation and they find out that Crimson Dawn has infiltrated not just the Black Sun crime syndicate, but other crime syndicates and the Empire and the Rebellion, like, they are everywhere. And that's probably important for us to know going forward with the Book of Boba Fett. And the way that they managed to escape, that Dr. Aphra and company managed to get out of the Vermilion, is that in this art room, there is an object called the Thought Dowser, which is an ancient artifact used by a cult called the Ascendant. And apparently the Ascendant were obsessed with dark technology, so dark, according to Dr. Afra, that even the Sith avoided it. Although apparently they did use it with apprentices to help train them in learning how to manipulate and compel others to you know, follow their own will. And I feel like just in general that might be worth knowing because, you know, when you think about the old expanded universe, aka Legends now, there was a point at which they said, you know, we can't keep doing this whole Empire thing as the main villain and keep bringing Palpatine back over and over again. And that's where, I'm sorry about the pronunciation in advance, the Yuzon Vong came into play. And so, you know, they had to come up with some other enemy for the good guys to fight. And so knowing that there is a cult called the Ascendant, which apparently has died out and all their secrets died out with them, according to Dr. Afra at this particular time during the original trilogy. But, you know, that means they were active at some point. So, yeah, if we need a new set of bad guys, for the good guys to fight well the ascendant has certainly been positioned as a possibility for the future meanwhile war of the bounty hunters issue 5 the mini series around which everything else circles that's the main event of this final month that we're looking at and in that issue here's what you need to know so boba fett and baylor valence are still on slave one they are still trying to catch the imperial shuttle that has han solo and when we left them the huts were getting in on the chase well the huts decided Decide to make a move against the Empire and I'll get into all the details on that but basically Han eventually ends up on the Executor and so Boba Fett says let's get on the Executor because that's the only way we're going to be able to get him and there are older codes <laughs> that Boba Fett has but they still work so he's able to get on board with Valence and they get so far before Boba Fett decides all right the deal with Valence is off and you know, I feel like Boba Fett cheated Valence on this one. Like, the way that they discussed it when they were down on Jakara was that they would you know, both get solo and then they would see what happens. Well, they hadn't gotten solo yet and Boba Fett said, okay, I guess I'm just done with this partnership and throws a little, you know, thermal detonator sticky bomb onto Baylor Valence and Valence blows up, but he's not out of it entirely he's just you know very gravely injured and Boba Fett says yeah see you later alligator meanwhile Crimson Dawn actually gives boarding coordinates for the millennium or boarding permissions for the millennium falcon wow that was a tough one to say um and lando and leia and chewie think oh maybe it's a trap but maybe it's not and we find out here's an example of crimson dawn infiltrating the empire because they're able to you know get the restarted millennium falcon onto the executor and they give leia and company directions to where han is being held and they're like why are you doing this and the imperial officer says await the dawn which is the code word to say oh yeah i'm with crimson dawn blah 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 so leia and lando and chewie actually beat boba fett to han like they wipe out all the troopers and officers that are guarding han and she's right there leia as she has her hand on the carbonite block and then boba fett shows up and says get away from my property and before anything can happen with that showdown the hut attack 
that's happening. A missile hits the side of the executor and breaks a hole open in the side and Han's carbonite block goes tumbling out, which is horrific. And Leia's like, Han, ah! And they can't do anything about that. But Boba Fett says, well, you can't do anything about that. And he jets out the hole. And as it's tumbling down toward the planet, he manages to fly down through the atmosphere in his armor in his Beskar armor so I guess it's made for that <laughs> and made for the brief exposure to space until he got through the atmosphere of the place and managed to scoop up the carbonite block for himself and that is how Boba Fett finally reacquires Han Solo in carbonite. Meanwhile the whole hut thing so Baku thinks that he is you know working for Crimson Dawn and working to kind of take over the hut council situation but he gets orders once the you know hut offensive to try to repossess the carbonite block for Han Solo he is a failure he gets ordered by Crimson Dawn to just press the attack and so what we find out and this is going to tie in the Star Wars issue and the Darth Vader issue is that Baku has been working for Crimson Dawn and he ultimately tells Vader that he was working for Crimson Dawn so yeah that's <laughs> probably wasn't a very smart idea on Baku's behalf but basically what it comes down to is that Kira was trying to reacquire Han and she had a plan to ultimately get him back to the quote-unquote people that love him or the people he loves which is the rebellion but it didn't go quite the way that she had hoped and so when the Empire got hold of the Carbonite block again and the Huts failed on their mission to retake it. She ordered Baku, the Hut, and company to assault the ship in order to create the distraction for the Millennium Falcon to go in and hopefully be able to steal Han off the ship. Meanwhile, Vader, of course, is very mad about Baku the Hut and goes to eliminate the entire Hut Council. So now Jabba the Hut is the only surviving member of the you know, main Hut Council and is now the head of the clans and all that stuff. So he is promising to establish a tremendous era of stability for relations between the Huts and the Empire but Kira's whole thing is that yeah maybe everything didn't go perfectly well but the relationship between the Empire and the Huts has been more strained now than it has been for quite a while and so that is working to her advantage and Crimson Dawn's advantage. And in the Bounty Hunters comic, Baylor Valence almost makes it off the Executor, but it happens that Darth Vader arrives back, and as he's flying through space trying to get to another ship, Vader pulls him back with the Force and ends up repairing him and saying that you serve me now at the end of that Bounty Hunters issue. And so the only other story that needs to be told, at least as far as Boba Fett goes, is the War of the Bounty Hunters one-shot issue that came out in this final group of stories. And this one focuses on IG-88, who was destroyed by Darth Vader a couple of issues ago, as we talked about. But it turns out that some character showed up and rebuilt him and was hired, basically, by Crimson Dawn to do the rebuilding. And IG-88 very rudely <laughs> kills that person for their trouble. And so then checks in with, it turns out, Devil Lompop, who is representing Crimson Dawn and says, yeah, your job is to go kill Boba Fett and take Han Solo away from him and deliver him back to Crimson Dawn. So yet another contingency plan, which, as we might suspect, doesn't work out. So IG-88 tracks Boba Fett down to Tatooine. Boba Fett arrives on Tatooine and is like, yeah, everybody knows I've got Han Solo now, so this is not going to be over until I, you know, turn him in. So I'm going to land somewhere else on Tatooine and check out what the situation is at Jabba's Palace, presumably first. That's where IG-88 finds Slave One and gets in and he's like, wow, here's Han Solo right here. This is too easy. And Boba Fett shows up and is like, yeah, okay, here we go. And so they have a shooting match, which for as many shots as were fired at each other and neither of them got hit is kind of impressive. But basically it turns out that Boba Fett had his own little portable carbon freezing situation installed on his ship while he was on Nar Shadda after having Han melt on his ship at the very beginning of this whole story. So very much like what our Mandalorian and the Mandalorian has on his ship, I guess. And he ends up triggering it. Boba Fett triggers the 
uh, carbon freezing situation and freezes IG-88. And then he just <laughs> leaves IG-88 standing out on the sand in the middle of Tatooine. And from there he takes off, presumably, to finally go to Jabba's palace, which that whole exchange or that whole interaction between IG-88 and Boba Fett takes place in between the end of the main story in that War of the Bounty Hunters issue 5 and the epilogue in War of the Bounty Hunters issue 5, where Boba Fett finally arrives at Jabba's Jabba's palace and turns in solo and Jabba said, look, I had to put the contract on you. People had to know that I had first claim on you and the contract's been canceled so you don't have to worry about it. It's all good. And Boba Fett says, well, that's fine. Well, here's solo and you know, I can take him away just as easily. So if you want him, pay me. And that is is how the story ends. Although I should say that there is an exchange between Jabba and Boba, and Jabba says, you know, like, hang out here, I got more jobs for you, and it'll be fun because you can show up every day and look at Solo's face in agony because I'm just gonna hang him on my wall. And Boba says, you know, you really should just throw him in the Sarlacc pit. He's been too much trouble to too many people for too long. He's caused me too much trouble. You should just be done with him. And <laughs> Yeah, that sort of turns out prophetic in a little bit of a way and also ironic in a little bit of a way too. And so there you go. That is the full rundown, the completion of the rundown on War of the Bounty Hunters and the stuff that we have learned about Boba Fett leading up to the events of Return of the Jedi, which is the nearest bit of in-depth storytelling and an in-depth look at Boba Fett's character that we get prior to the events of the Book of Boba Fett where we're going to see him in just a couple short days. And that is going to do it for this episode of the show. It just remains for me to say thank you so much for joining me for it as always. And may the Force be with you wherever in the world you may be. By Seven is not endorsed or sponsored yet by Lucasfilm Limited, Disney, or 20th Century Fox, and is intended for entertainment and information purposes only. Star Wars, the Star Wars logo, all names and pictures of Star Wars characters, vehicles, and any other Star Wars related items are registered trademarks and or copyrights of Lucasfilm Limited, other respective trademark and copyright holders. May the force be with them. All original content is copyright 2021 by Star Wars 7x7. We hope you love it.